This episode is sponsored by Agent CRM. If you're in sales and tired of paying three, four, or five different companies for your email, CRM, funnels, phone, follow-up automation, check out Agent CRM. It's an all-in-one tool that combines all that you need to reach out, nurture, and close your clients. They've got weekly support calls so you can get up and running in no time. Get a free 14-day trial by going to the link below in the show notes. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dan Nguyen, and I have a very special guest with me today. He is a business growth expert, author, and serial entrepreneur. He started his career by accident, like most entrepreneurs, when he broke his leg, not like most entrepreneurs, and dropped out of his undergraduate uh, accounting and finance program. At 18, he turned to what he knew best, which is landscaping, and his business growth endeavors began as he doubled his business each year for the next five years until he sold it. Since then, Carl has built three multi-million dollar businesses before the age of 40, mentored the launch of over 5,000 businesses and trained and certified over 7,000 business coaches in 35 countries. I do want to welcome to the show, Carl Gould from Seven Stage Advisors. Hey, Dan, thanks so much. Really looking forward to our discussion today. My pleasure. And, you know, uh, when your team reached out to me and gave me the information um, about your background, I uh, wanted to have a really good discussion with you because I think the topic we're going to discuss today has a lot of relevance to a lot of people, a lot of business owners in, in a wide span of industries. And today we're going to talk about pricing strategies that will immediately grow your business and and you can explain more because I don't know how it does it and establish yourself as an authority uh, in your niche. Um, but before we kind of get all into the nuts and bolts of that, can you uh, give us a little bit more detail about how you got started and how you ended up where you are today? Sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, like you said, I, I had a, a bit of a you know leg injury. I broke my kneecap, snapped it just about in half and and tore my knee up pretty good. I mean, it was wasn't very pretty. And um you know, and had to leave school. And since I was paying my own way for school, um, going back to Delaware, which is where I was at the time, it really wasn't in the cards. I just wasn't able to do that, which which was unfortunate. And so I had to figure out a way to make money. I mean, I had been sitting on the, literally laying on the couch with my leg elevated, basically in traction for three months. And then I uh, had to learn how to walk again once they cut the cast off. So there I am six months out of school. One thing I learned, you leave school for six months. There was no Joe Biden at the time. I had to pay back all my own loans. You know, everything came due. I had to pay back all of my own loans. All of my grants went away. And so I did two things simultaneously. I, I signed up for County College of Morris. So, so the local county college for, for courses in business management, because that's what they had. And I started my landscaping company and actually CCM had the number two horticulture program in the state and we live in the garden state. So that's pretty high, high praise. And so, yeah, that a great horticulture program. So I, you know, I wanted to, whatever I was going to do, I wanted to do right. I wanted to do the best I could. So I signed up for business management and horticulture. And so I started my landscaping company by day student by night. I was a, I, I went to professional bartending school so I could be a bartender on the weekends. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Cause I needed to make money, uh, right. earn, earn benefits. You know, I, I'm, I mean, I'm night, I'm 18 and a half. I'm on my own. This is it. Yeah. You know, I just turned 19 actually. Um, and so I'm like, well, you know, this is it. This is the only way I can do it. And so I launched my first business. I had done landscaping on uh, throughout high school and I grew up in the construction trades. So uncles on both sides of the family had construction companies and you know, I was, um, uh, you know, kind of knew it my whole life. You know, my brother had a construction company the whole bit. So, so I got started in that and it actually went quite well. You know, um, the landscaping company that I had doubled every year until I sold it seven years later. And then I started a construction company after that. And I grew that business and then ultimately sold that in 2004. Um, but in 1990 is when I went to a, a, a personal development seminar by Tony Robbins, um, you know, or earlier days for him back then, you know, 32 years ago, and uh, really fell in love with the idea of helping people design their life 
write out their goals, pursue their dreams. And I just thought, wow, this is awesome. I love this. And so I dove into any certification you could get at the time. NLP, DISC, you know, um, Myers-Briggs, you know, um, uh, what am I thinking of? What's the leadership program? Um, uh, Carnegie. What am I thinking? Duh. Carnegie Leaders, Dale Carnegie Leadership um, and uh, the Adiza's methodology. um, You name it. I got involved in it if it was available. And I really wanted to immerse myself and learn what is this coaching all about. And so all through the 90s, I did coaching for various sources, coaching for Robbins, coaching on um, RP, uh, sorry, um, Franklin Covey, um, you know, uh, planning systems, um, Ken Blanchard, situational leadership, you name it. I got involved in all these methodologies and I was that guy. I was that certified coach, (laughs) you know, for all these different Uh, systems. So if you called up their company and they say, well, you're going to work with one of our team, you worked with me back then. That was me. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I start, in 1996, I started working with a business mentor on my construction company, and I really liked the process. You know, we would sit down, we would brainstorm, I'd come up with ideas for the business, the coach would, would trigger, you know, help me trigger my thinking. And, and, I was, and, and it hit me one day, I'm like, all right, this is what I want to do. I, wanted, I want to take all of my coaching experience. this point, I've been coaching almost a decade, you know, and, um, and I, uh, plus my entrepreneurial background. I already bought and sold one business successfully. I was in my second, about to sell that business. You know, I've been an entrepreneur now for well over a decade as well. And because I started my first business in 1985, you know, and so at this point I was, you know, more than 15 years in. And so I said, okay, this is what I want to do. So I tell everybody, I want to be a professional coach. And they're like, really? That's exciting. What sport? (laughs) <laughs> I'm like, what are you looking for? I said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I want to be a professional coach. I'm going to take your business to the gym. I'm going to ask you questions. I'm going to probe and clarify and challenge your your limits and help you increase your identity. And they were just looked at me like, what? Think, well, what? What is that? You know, <laughs> I don't know what that is. And so, um, but you know, because they they're the job I wanted in the nineties didn't exist like the coaching Mm -hmm. industry, the way it is now just didn't exist that way. I mean, there were coaches and there were coaching practices, but the coaching business I wanted just, it just didn't exist. So when I told people about it, they were like kind of scratching their heads saying, you know, what are we talking about here? Anyway, fast forward to 2002 and I launched the business as I know it now. And because my, my passion was, Look, somebody showed me how to get out of a business that I wasn't happy in, it was successful, but I wasn't happy in it, and find the business for me and help my help me reach my potential. And so I said, I want to help people do the same. Now, in my case, I needed to make coaching a six-figure business simply to survive. You know, I, I'm married at the time, two kids at the time, um, and um, you know, I have a house, you know, to live. I got to pay the bills, and so back then. The expression was that coaches had to take a full-time job in order to feed their coaching addiction. <laughs> no one can make enough money on just coaching yeah. that they have yeah. to have a full-time job. And most coaches were yeah. moonlighting at the time. Mm-hmm. And I said, that's not what I want. I don't want to have to take two other full-time jobs so I could do what I love. I want to do this full-time. I want this to be my business. And so in 2002, I launched the company As You Know It Today. And, um, and so started a coaching business where we come into businesses as a team and we do coaching, consulting, and, and, um, you know, we show independently owned businesses, how to find their niche, increase their pricing, innovate their operations, and really build a sustainable company to help them reach their full potential. Like someone had helped me once before. Very good. So (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I mean, I mean, what, what a journey, right? And, you know, you're right about the coaching, coaching industry today. It's, it's, you know, can't run into, you can't turn the corner or walk down the street without running to, to someone who's been coached or someone who, who is a coach. For but, sure. I mean, you were, you were, um, you know, uh, uh, one of the earlier people who were, became a professional coach as a, 
uh, sustaining, I suppose, sustaining yeah. um, uh, pr profession. But and and to date, um, you have a very interesting topic because it's on pricing, which is, you know, everyone obviously charges charges for something. But there's and you probably get this question a lot. And what spawned this particular idea is like, how do I charge for for my services, especially if there's what we perceived as no competitor in the market, right? It's not like sometimes to the the beholder is not an apple apple uh, apples to apples comparison. But like, let's talk about pricing strategies in general for a little bit here. Sure, sure. Yeah. So the first thing you, you all need to know about your pricing strategy it is it is the number one language you and number one conversation you will have with your clients. So pricing is a language. And the moment you announce your pricing, it does two things. The first thing it does is it tells them who you are as a supplier. So if I am if I charge a lot, wow, he he or she is the premium priced supplier in the market or mid-range or low depending on what the pricing is. If there's depending on your pricing, there's a perception of value. Depending on how you price, it tells them what kind of company you are. Do you charge a la carte, meaning for every itemized item, they have, there's a fee for that? Is there, um, or are you a buffet? Are you a buffet restaurant where you pay one price and all the food is available to you? Are you a la carte where you, um, based on what you order off the menu is what you pay? You know, are you a diner where you pay, uh, you know, you come in, you pay after the meal. Are you a buffet where you pay before the meal? Right. So, so there's a number of, there's a number of, um, you know, ways that you communicate to your clientele the second that you, you have your pricing. Are you a membership model where I just pay a monthly membership, you know, and then I, I can purchase an add on from there. So you tell the market who you are. So this is why pricing is so important because you have to get it right. You can't say, no, no, no. I want you to also pay for this. Well, wait a minute, you're a buffet. So why would I pay anything extra? I'm not used to doing that, right? And so, so that's the first thing you do is you tell them who you are. Second thing that you do when you la launch your pricing is you tell the customer who they are. Now, this is dangerous and a little risky because how do I know exactly what kind of buyer Dan is? I just went out with premium pricing. Maybe Dan is more of an economy shopper. Maybe he looks for deals. Maybe I want to sell Dan a Mercedes Benz and he's like, well, I'm a Subaru dude. Or maybe I'm trying to sell you a Subaru and you're like, I wouldn't look at a car like that. I'm a Mercedes guy. There's not right or wrong, but my message needs to match my audience. And pricing is a huge part of my message. Walmart and Target are will never be confused. Right? Walmart caters to a very specific type buyer. Target caters to a specific buyer. Yes, there's sometimes it overlaps, but for the most part, that's not the case. You can see it in there. It drives their branding. It drives their mascot. It drives, it drives almost everything that they do. You know, Walmart knows their audience so well that when they build a Walmart, they put an RV hookup in the parking lot <laughs> because if you are an RV owner, you can go to any Walmart, stay overnight, or stay, you know, refresh. It's, you can't move in by any stretch, but it's for free, right? That's how well they know their clientele. Target doesn't have an RV hookup in their parking lots, right? Because that's not their clientele. It's not right or wrong. It's just Walmart knows who their clientele is. Target knows who their clientele is. And they act accordingly. And their pricing does the same thing. So pricing is an incredibly powerful language that you um, that you are you are telling the other part of the language that you're using when you um, you announce your pricing is how exclusive are you, mm. right? If you price your you know some people will buy products simply because others can't because the the product might represent exclusivity, or conversely, a product might um, might you know um, give the perception of inclusivity, right? So using cars as an example of, for another time, watch a Mercedes Benz commercial. Other than the commercial in the, in the Christmas when they've got all the red ones and the white one in the back when they're doing the Santa and the reindeer thing, right. how many cars are typically in a Mercedes Benz commercial? Usually just one. 
yep. one. And it's yep. usually black or silver, right. right? And why is that? Because they're trying to give out the aura of exclusivity, limited mm-hmm. access. That's important to their buyer. When you, when you see a Ford or Chevy or Dodge commercial, how many cars are typically in there? Three. What colors are those cars? Red, blue, and off-white. Right. Almost always. Maybe gray. They don't want to do white because white is a, is a status color. Hmm. Um, and off-white or gray is not. And so, and so they'll have three cars. Why? Because it's a family. Mm-hmm. Right? Right? So, you know, they'll show how many miles the car will go and passing the car off from one generation to the next. Mercedes doesn't do that. Yeah. I mean, I'm not keeping this car long enough for even to get a dent in it. <laughs> I will never change the, I, I'll never change the brakes on this thing. That's, what, that's someone else's problem. Yeah. I'll get the new Mercedes at that point. Yeah. Right. Again, not right or wrong. It's just, you're speaking a certain language. And so you, your price, the pricing is the tip of the arrow for almost everything in your, that you do as a business. And so it's wildly important that, wildly important that you get your pricing right. Um, and especially when you're launching a business or getting your, your proof of concept, pricing is a big one. Would, would you say, like most things in marketing, pricing is experimental? Yes, it, it can be. Um, the, the precise pricing and the precise bonuses, features, advantage, features that you offer, that's experimental. But when you're looking at prices from a category standpoint, hmm. you know, if I have a certain audience, I better be high. If mm-hmm. I own, if I own malls, for example, the preferred, um, the preferred parking spots, they need to have a cost to them. They need to be exclusive. Hmm. There are certain things, certain buyers have to have exclusivity, premium, you know, limited mm-hmm. access, higher price, you know, and cause those, those, there's certain tendencies towards certain buyers. Right. Right. To other categories, other things are important like discounts, you know, mm-hmm. like bundling, like other perks need to be available to those groups. But then you're right. You experiment with the exact, you know, what exactly does this group want? So for example, mm-hmm. my wife and I are tennis fans and we like to go to the U S open. Mercedes-Benz is a sponsor, right? Um, where the U.S. Tennis Center in New York is, uh, City Field for the for the Mets baseball mm-hmm. and LaGuardia Airport are all very close to each other. Hmm. Okay, that compound is very close to each other. Well, the City Field parking that is closest to the U.S. Tennis Center, Mercedes-Benz ropes off and is exclusive to Mercedes-Benz owner because mm-hmm. it's the shortest walk to the tennis center. Hmm. Mercedes knows that about their clients. You know, you buy a Mercedes, you want to be able to have the, you want to have the preferred parking, right? Mm-hmm. So you got to, you, you have to find regionally what, what resonates with your clientele um, and, and you want to find out what's important to them. Mercedes Benz clients are also tennis fans. That's mm. why they sponsor the U.S. Open. There's a, um, uh, a thing Dan Kennedy says, uh, you don't. You don't want to be the second most expensive. Either you're at the top, the most expensive, or you're the cheapest, or you're at the bottom. Do you subscribe to those particular philosophies? 100%. 100%. So in pricing, those at the top and those at the bottom are perceived as the experts in that particular niche. So if you think about it, you say to yourself, how in the world can Walmart bring you all of those products at such a cheap price. What do they know that the rest of us don't know? Well, they've mastered logistics. They, they are so good at logistics that they can, they, you know, where the rest of the world runs on about 80% efficiency, they're almost a hundred. They are fully 20% more efficient than the rest of the world. And their prices reflect that. So we say, gosh, I don't, I don't know how they do it. Well, that's why they're Walmart. They're that good at it, right? Google, we get search for free. How are they able to bring us the world's library? Every question we can answer in uh, that we can think of, 
um, get answered that we can think of. Millions of of question, of answers per second for free. The world's library in a second. Well, they're Google. They have an algorithm. They they know how to do this in a way, and they have a business model that allows us to get the entire thing for free. It's amazing, right? So we say, gosh, what are they doing to be able to charge that low? Now let's look at let's look at Rolls Royce. Let's look at Rolex. Let's look at um, Tesla. Let's look at these premium brands, and you say, wow, how are they able to get that price? What are they offering for that? They must be good. We assume immediately they must be good. As a matter of fact, if any of you want to try this out, go to a mall, stand outside, and as shoppers come in and out, just say, excuse me, ma'am, sir, today, are you looking to buy the most, the highest priced products or the highest quality products? You know, what do you think they would say? Highest quality. Yep. How do you judge quality? Price, right? So if if something is more expensive, we will automatically assume, wow, there must be something to it. There must be a reason why. There must be something else in this that makes this a more expensive pen, shirt, laptop, you know. I mean, what are you getting for all the extra you pay in an Apple iPhone that you're not getting in a in a competitor phone or a, or a laptop, right? Well, they've and, got and all these cool features. They've got community. They've got, you know, there's all these other features that Apple's another another brilliant example yeah. of, of building a community and speaking to their audience. Microsoft would never get away with some of the crap that Apple pulls, slowing down the battery when the new phone comes out. I yep. mean, the stuff that they have done. Could you imagine if Microsoft mm-hmm. did that? They'd be crucified. Right. <laughs> they would be absolutely crucified. But Apple's audience forgives them. Hey, don't do that yeah. again. All right, we won't do it again. Right? It's just like if you think about it, think about your favorite musical act. If they put out a bad album, are you going to all of a sudden not be a fan? Yeah. You'll forgive them. Like, yeah. all right, I'm not going to this tour, but. I might listen to a couple songs, but I'll wait around for the next one, you know, and yeah. you'll forgive them. Okay. We don't yeah. know if the new Taylor Swift album is really good, but boy, is she on tour and she, you know, she <laughs> put her, her tour up for sale and sold out the entire tour in less than yeah. what an hour. She broke right. the internet. Right. 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 Before most yeah. of her fans even ho- heard the new album. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, for the same premium buyer, um, they probably have this conversation too. If it's if it's too cheap or too less expensive, I would say, what's wrong with it? That's right. That's right. Remember? Oh gosh, um, I want to go back to um, I think it was the two thousands. Timberland boots got really popular with the urban crowd, right? And all of a sudden, in the cities, people were wearing boots that normally hikers and outdoors men and outdoors women were wearing, and so all of a sudden their core audience started to go away from it. And so they had to, so they renamed that boot up the price of their core boot sales return, you know? So yeah, yep. uh, there's, yep. there is something to that. Here's the other thing. You have to raise your pricing on a regular basis. Hmm. Right? And you say, well, wait a minute, there's a pandemic and there's inflation and there's a recession and we can't do that. And we're trying to, we're trying to keep things low. Hold on. Hold on. Most of your clientele, not only are they willing to pay more, they don't want you to do that. They want you to protect the community that they've created. I'll give you an example. In 1990, I become a coach and coaching and doing training, like small trainings and, you know, speaking to board groups, it's pretty, it goes hand in hand. But in the early 2000s, I decide I want to be a speaker, right? I hire a speaking coach. And the, my speaking coach says, Carl, yeah, you're not getting in front of an audience like that. Go to Joseph A. Bank and buy yourself two suits. Buy the signature suit. And I'm like, I don't like suits. And she's like, I know you don't like suits, but if you're going to get up in front of an audience, you're wearing a suit, right? You hired me as a coach. I'm telling you, you're wearing a suit. Uh, all right, you know. So <laughs> anyway, so she goes, now listen, I, want, I know you, Mr. Negotiator. 
You're going to go into Joseph A. Bank. You're going to see that these suits are $1,000 a pop. Uh, just go in, buy two suits, pay the price, walk out with your suits. You know, don't come back to me and say they're too much. I'm telling you now what they are. All right, all right. So I go in, sure enough, I get two, I get two suits. And by the time I'm done with shirts and cufflinks and collar stays and belts and all that, $2,500 gone. <laughs> nice. So now fast forward seven years, late 2000s, and I hire a publicist and I'm going to start doing TV work. And she says, yeah, that's those old suits you have aren't going to work. And you only have two. So she puts me on YouTube. She goes, look, she goes, look at you. Gray, blue, gray, blue, gray, blue. Gray. We got, we need a little bit of variety here. She goes, I want you to go back to Joseph A. Bank, four suits this time. And she told me which ones up to get. I'm like, oh, the signature suit? She's like, yes, the signature suit. She goes, I can't put you on a panel on CNN or on Fox. Look at how nice they're dressed and look at your suit. I'm like, you're right. Fair enough. I got You got me. All right. So I go in. I'm getting fitted for, four, for these suits. And I didn't even ask the price. Uh, because I'm like, all right, thousand bucks times four. Okay. So I'm standing there, I'm getting fitted. The guys, you know, the guys working on the cuff of the pants. Mm -hmm. And I looked down to him and I said, I got to tell you, if you would have told me that I was going to spend $4,000 on suits someday, I'd have told you you were crazy. And he goes, 4,000. You're not going to spend 4,000 on suits today. And I was like, oh, it's more. He goes, no, he goes, they're on sale. If you buy one, you get three for free. (laughs) And I said, what? You're kidding me. You're telling me I picked the the weekend that you're going to, you buy one, get three free. And he goes, no, we do the sale all the time. You could have come in anytime during the year for that. And I said, I said, wait a minute. Seven years ago, I paid a thousand dollars for the signature suit. I said, this is the same signature suit, right? Yeah. I, have they improved in any way? Like, oh, of course, we're always improving our product. I said, well, wait a minute. So how is it that seven years later, the same suit is $250 when it was $1,000 then? And and so where do you think my head went to? I'm getting a great deal today or I got screwed seven years ago? Yeah. Right. And so that's the risk of not raising your pricing to your core audience. Mm. Right now, if I was Joe, now I don't understand the story. Men's Warehouse, which is a discount retailer, mm. bought them, you know, use discounting as a use discounting and low prices as a, mm. as their shtick. And mm. they, they admitted in articles that we may have ruined this luxury brand. <laughs> what I would have done was mm. I would have taken all the other series of suits and I would have lowered those and I would have went out to the audience and said, the signature suit, we're going to protect. Your executives, you're still out there. It's 2009. The world went upside down a year ago. We get it. But you still got to make it happen. And we're going to protect that line. That's what they should have done. But they didn't. And so I went from thinking that, hey, I, I was told to come buy this suit because this is apparently the suit not a lot of other people can buy. I'm supposed to be an expert which means I'm supposed to know certain things that the rest of the world's not supposed to know. So all of a sudden I got the, I have the suit that anyone can buy if they want. Anyone can buy this, right? It's the last suit I ever bought from them, you know, because they broke my trust. Now I know it sounds odd. Like, wait a minute, you would have been comfortable if they, if they charged more. Yes, because what I was buying was not just the suit, but the exclusivity of the suit. And they took that away. So now all they did was discount it. Right. All they, nobody from the company called me to explain. They just lowered the price, but price is a powerful language. Mm -hmm. As a result, they lost me. I don't know who else they lost, but they lost me. They lost a lot more. I don't, you know, but they, they certainly did not appeal to why I was there buying their suits. Both times. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, that's a, that's a powerful story because, you know, there, there's, there's something about an expensive customer, right? And if you're not, you're not, you're protecting your, your exclusivity, 
that's going to go out the window and and it's going to cost you a lot more than what you're going to re come back you can get with discounted pricing or you know whatever pricing strategies you have to to um going on at the at the moment yeah i mean if you look at bugatti the mm -hmm. um the auto manufacturer they hand make all of their automobiles and the prices you hear from anywhere from a million to two and a half million dollars like think about that for a moment right. 2.5 million dollars for a car what else could you buy with two and a half million dollars well a house a few cars yes. college a boat <laughs> you know what i mean vacations right. But right. yet Bugatti has a wait list. If you want a Bugatti, you, you know, one, you're not negotiating price. Two, you're going to have to wait. I mean, that's how, now I'm not saying premium customers are better than, you know, better than, you know, um, uh, value-based or price customers. I mean, as a matter of fact, the airlines will tell you, we make all of our money out of economy. We don't make money on first class, but we need first class to prove to people we are a quality airline, mm. and then we fill the rest of the plane mm. on economy. Right? I mean, that's yeah. why. I yeah. mean, they try to make first class as small as possible because they mm -hmm. lose a seat, two seats every yeah. row. Yeah, and typically, you know? typically they make you walk through first class to get to economy. Right. Think about that now, yeah. because they want you to see it. Yep. Right. No, now, why yep. don't they just load economy from the back of the plane? Okay. Right. But they want you to yep. walk past it and say, wow, someday. Yeah. Wow. Why do they yep. get a meal? Yeah. Why do they get, why are they getting a drink? I know, I have to yeah. wait until we're like in the air before I get my, they want yeah. you to see it. They're, they're saying, look, look at our premium service. Look at our first mm -hmm. class service. Look at what you can be as a customer, you know? And so, um, and so, you know, the, you know, all customers are valuable to their to their businesses. You know, that's why pricing is so important. You know, like I yeah. keep coming back to it because yeah. to fill that plane, they have to have an over-the-top first class or business class service so they can fill the rest of the plane. You know, if you if you think yeah. about it, going back to cars because it's an easy example. If you go to an auto dealer, what car do they put in the middle of the dealership showroom floor? On a red carpet behind velvet ropes. What which card is that normally? Their flagship. Their it's their flagship, their flagship. which they yep. never sell. No. Yep. Right? The tire goes flat, the yeah. battery dies. It's a pain in the butt for them. But they need it. When when um uh when Chrysler got their bailout loan from the government in two thousand and nine, the government said, Well, listen, the the um oh god, I just went blank on it. What's the uh the Viper. They said, well, you got to close down the Viper. They're like, no, we're not closing down the Viper. Well, you don't sell that. That division doesn't make money. It's not supposed to. It's a marketing division. We need the Viper in the middle of the showroom to get people to come in to the, to the uh, dealership in the first place so we can sell them a minivan. Like they had to explain. They're like, listen, we get it. The Viper and, and the Viper eventually that division did, you know, Chrysler spun that division off. But it's never designed to make any money. It's designed to get for mm -hmm. foot traffic. It's a marketing expense. You know, yeah. it's a heck of a beautiful car. I mean, right, it's, right. you know, it's not a car that they mass produced or, or, you know, really made. It wasn't a commercial driver for them. It was a marketing mm -hmm. expense for them to show how good their technology and how muscle their cars were. You know, they said, look, we could put a thousand, a thousand horsepower under the hood. What could we do for your minivan or your Ram truck, you know, as a result? Right. So I, I think, you know, pricing kind of, you touched a little bit on, on, on the first point is about knowing your customer. And I remember um, I did some work for my uncle and, uh, and, you know, I, I, I gave him a discount as a family discount and, um, um, but I showed him what basically my rack rate was, and then I showed him the discount. And uh, uh, he later told me, "Hey, you, if you want more customers or clients, you got to lower your price." And I told him, "I said, no, that's not the customer I'm going for. I'm helping you because you're my relative." <laughs> but yeah, sure. You, if you came to me and say, "Hey, I only pay, pay this much," I would say, "I'm sorry. I that's that's you know, my rate is my rate and." I'm happy to, you know, refer you to any of my colleagues who charge this, but, you know, um, 
you know, want, yeah, you very, want the, depending on who your customer is, you want to make sure you're speaking their language. You're right. Because yeah, had yeah. you lowered your prices, you would have gotten more of the wrong type of client. Yeah. Right now. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. So you're, um, uh, you know, I find, I find this interesting, you know, you, um, Subaru, for example, goes out of their way to not have their prices too high because their clientele buys the car, keeps it in the family, passes it along to the second generation. It is a value play, right? And so they go out of their way to not be flashy. You know, their cars are mostly earth tones. They're all wheel drive, right? That's important to their clientele. And so, um, so yeah, I, Subaru is a great example of a company that knows their, um, knows their, um, clientele during the big downturn of 2008 to 2013, there were only one of three car makers, none of them U S based that grew their, uh, their auto sales during that time. I mean, they really, really know their customer and customer well. Um, and so it goes all the way down to the coloring. So, you know, if you're Walmart, Walmart is, you know, Walmart nowhere in its marketing will tell you any of the products that they sell are quality. Oh yeah. They're not, they're not yeah. selling that. Yeah. They say, mm -hmm. listen, you want to live better. You know, it's, you know, lower prices for better living. You know, listen, if for something doesn't meet your quality, send it back, we'll replace it. But we're, we, we've never made the claim that what we're selling you is quality and their clients don't expect it. Right. Their clients say, right. listen, I get that there'll be some, you know, compromises I need to make with the purchases I make here because I'm getting it at a low at a lower price. They're totally cool with that. It fits that it fits that buyer. And so it's a very it's a very happy relationship between them because Walmart is really dialed in as to what the expectations are. And that type of buyer has no problem saying, all right, well, I'm going back to Walmart again, right? Because I go multiple times. I'll bring back the goods that I, I don't care for. Happy to swap them out because they'll give me credit. I'll go back in. I'll buy something different. Yeah. So that's if switching gears just slightly. How does, let's just focus on maybe this, uh, the coaching industry uh, where it's typically one-on-one, uh, -on -one, right? How do you provide more value? Because at some point, Five hundred dollars an hour, thousand dollars an hour for coach. They, you know, they all kind of clump together. It says like, well, if you're charging thousand dollars, this guy charging thousand dollars. What am I gonna? Why? Why should I go with you if you're all changing to the same price? So, what's? How does one differentiate from their competitor? And once pricing gets kind of commoditized in a sense. Yeah, it's a good. It's a good point. Taking the coaching industry specifically okay. because the coaching okay. industry is very mature. Right. It's got it's it's it is well micro niched, you know, so I can I you know, when I became a coach, it was enough to just say I was a coach. Then you had to say that you were either life or business coach. Then if you're a business coach, it was business or executive. You know, now it's sales coach, marketing coach, logistics coach, finance coach, strategy coach, HR coach, you know. So. The way you differentiate now is you either have to pick, now this will sound a little counterintuitive, but stay with me on it. You have to pick your very fine specialty, which includes becoming a generalist right now. So pick the type of person and the type of work that you're going to do. Okay. So I am going to be a... Uh, relationship coach. I'm going to work with women. I'm going to work with women who um, are divorced. I'm going to be a health and nutrition coach. And I'm going to work with people who are more than 30 pounds overweight over age 40. Like that's a long tail. That's just not mm -hmm. like I just need to lose five pounds. I'm not your guy. No. I'm looking for people who need to lose more than 30 pounds and are over a certain age because there's some urgency there, I believe at least, right? So you want to pick that niche. Now, what we did um, was we chose to be a generalist. And what I mean by that is, as a generalist coach, um, 
we found it was the hardest thing to be. It's not jack of all trades, master of none. It's you have to have mastered enough things in your career that you can coach on a variety of topics at a high level. It is an incredibly high bar to jump over. We've been at it for 30 years, you know, and some of our coaches have been together as a team for over 20 years. So we are, you know, we're, we're, a, you know, an old hat at it. But our specialty is that we are a generalist, right? And so there's certain things we'll do. So we are not going to get in there and coach you on losing 30 pounds for people over 40. However, we will bring the coaching to a certain point. And as a generalist, we know when to bring in the proper specialist. Mm -hmm. Then as a generalist, we take a team approach to coaching, not one-on-one. -on -one. So we differentiate ourselves that way. That's just our way. If you are a, so the first place that you differentiate is your niche. And I would say even micro niche, you're going to niche down two or three branches. So, so start with business or life, right? then it's likely what sector of life, like pick the life wheel or the business wheel, what slice of that wheel are you on? Then what age group and likely what gender? What we find is a lot of business coaches tend to be male and they work with males, some female, right? Some female coaches, some, some female clients. Um, life coaches tend to be more female, working with females, some males. I mean, these are just gener total generalities, right? Um, when, uh, the coaching industry itself was built by females, women coaches, we could thank the industry for them. Uh, they started the industry. They were the majority of the industry. When I started out in coaching, it was 90% women. So we can thank women for the coaching industry because they built it. It's brilliant. It's amazing. Right. But you'll start to find, like, you'll start to see, well, I work mostly with men. I work mostly with women. And here's what what has happened in their life that has led, led me to, to that particular, um, that particular niche. And so, so that's where you would go again, no right or wrong. You know, you pick the area of coaching, the area of life or business that resonates with you. And then you likely take on and you like define your niche that way, that way and take on that niche. All right. So here, we're here with Carl Gould with seven stage advisors. We're getting towards the end here. Carl, uh, is there any kind of last things you want to share with us with regards to pricing and establishing yourself as an authority in your niche? Yeah, well, as, as an authority, if you remember from earlier, what we said was the higher priced or highest priced or lowest priced in the niche are seen as the experts. Now, for most of us, we can't be Walmart. We can't be Google, right? And we have a service business. So it is easier. I don't mean easy just easier, easier to be the highest priced in our niche rather than the lowest, simply because we can't do the volume play. You know, there's only 16, there's 2000 coaching hours in a year. You know, most people would say you, you're, you'd be doing well to get in 1600 or more, you know, 1600 is, is a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of coaching. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, if you think about it and if you're charging 50 to a hundred dollars an hour, you know, that's a 80 to $160,000 a year practice. That's a good practice. That's a very good practice. You'd be making more than most at that level, to put it that way. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's easier to micro niche yourself down and really define uh, your, your, you know, who you want to work with and for what reason. And then in that niche, be among the highest because that's where you'll be able to exert your authority, establish your expertise, and you'll be thought of as you'll be thought of as one of the tops in that field. And in the in the environment that we're in today, the the social climate, the business climate we're in, buyers defer to experts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so that has yep. implications. Yep. One, and you're a specialist, or you're that generalist I mentioned, mm -hmm. and you're priced among the top, and you have to deliver. You know, you can't just say, you can't just throw a high price out there and not deliver. You have to deliver. Right. I remember um, there's a thing Jay Abraham says with regards to selling and 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 um, uh, getting new clients is like the buyers are implicitly asking you to lead them, right? As to your point, as to, you know, uh, uh, looking for experts, lead them to the solution they're looking for. 
Right. I mean, think about it. When you go, when I go to a concert, I don't want the, I don't want the singer to say, so Dan, what do you want us to sing? I'm like, I, I was hoping you thought that through and you come here to be entertained. Yeah, exactly. I want to sit like down you, and you play the music. <laughs> right. How many times you go to a restaurant and you say to the server, what would you recommend tonight? What's good tonight? Uh, right. You want them to say, Oh, yeah. tonight's all about the duck or all about mm-hmm. the stir yep. fry. You know, you gotta have the burger. This is a mm-hmm. special ale. You got to, you know, we want, we want, we don't want to be told what to do, but we do like to be led. I, I, right. I couldn't agree more. And yeah. yes, we want, we want our vendors to take our input, but then we want them to use their genius because they're smarter at right. this stuff than we are and come back to us and surprise us and say, we took in all the feedback and look at what we've designed for you. Like, wow. All right. I'm in. Yeah. All right. Thank you again, Carl, for spending some time with us. Um, We're towards the end here, and we end every session with rapid fire um, lightning questions for the entrepreneur. So are you ready? I'm born ready. Bring it on. All right. So um, who do you look up to? Who do I look up to? I look up my my dad. Um, I'm proud of my my kids inspire me every day. Uh, Tony mm-hmm. Robbins was a big influence in my life. Each Akadiza is probably the smartest guy I've ever mm-hmm. worked with. Um, though those are really uh, those are people that really um, uh, you know um, Oprah Winfrey is an inspiration for mm-hmm. me. So th- those would be on my list. All right. Uh, what's the best business book you've ever read? The best business book, uh, Cash Flow Quadrant. Robert Kiyosaki, That's for country, okay. right? His uh, other one, Rich Dad Poor Dad, Poor Dad changed, oh, changed the way. I, I mean, thought... his books are brilliant. I've read yeah. a big Kiyosaki fan. Yeah, I've read them I all, but Cash Flow Quadrant to me was yeah. like, all right. Now, Keith Cunningham. Kudos to Keith Cunningham because he's he was the force behind that one. But hmm. but yeah, yeah. Um, best business advice you've ever received. Best business advice: Marketing never stops. No matter what business you think you're in, you're in the marketing business. Never, never stop promoting your business. It's too hard to catch up. Yep. Uh, if you can do one thing over again, what would it be? If I could do one thing over again, back in 2002, when I was, I certified and trained over 7,000 coaches worldwide, I would have built more of a community and I would have either franchised it or had a business model where it stayed tighter. I educated a lot and and set a lot of standards in the coaching community, but I, I would have built more of a community back then. All right. Um, are you familiar with the term three feet from gold? I am. How do you know when you're three feet from gold or when to pivot in your business? <laughs> well, one, if you're three feet from gold, you can't see that it's gold. That's true. You saw the gold 10 feet away. That's right. You saw the gold 20 feet away. And you dreamed of the gold in the beginning. So all the clues that you're on your way, but the gold always disappears right before you get it. And then it magically appears. And so what I would do is when you you know you're three feet away from the gold, if it disappears from you in the moment, when it already has been visible to you up to that point, you know you're close. Now you know you're close because you're standing right on top of it. All right. And lastly, uh, what's the biggest challenge in your business today? Today, a uh, business challenge, biggest challenge today is I'm in the middle of a few launch situations. And uh, so the biggest challenge is just is proof of concept, getting them into the market and getting them financially stable. So those are those are the things that I'm working on right now. And and um, and I'm three feet from gold, gold, three feet, Dan, Jeez. I'm three okay. feet away. Yeah. And and you know it, too. Right. And I know because it, it disappeared right. on me. So I know we're close. We must be close. All right. Hey, again, Carl uh, Gould with Seven Stage Advisors. Uh, If um, the listeners want to reach out to you, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Yeah. So best way, best way to find me is go to my personal site, carl360.com. So C-A-R-L-360.com. Connect with me there. All of my social media, every way uh, that we can intersect is all there in one spot. So that's the best way to get me. All right. Thanks again so much with, for your time, Carl. I uh, hope we get a chance to talk again soon. This so so uh, so informative, so fantastic, and um, we'll catch up again again soon. Terrific. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. All right.